Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, February 10th, we are studying Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 39. Jesus continues to reveal the authority of his word. He rebukes the wind and the waves on the Sea of Galilee, and he defeats demons in the country of the Gerasenes. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, the Reverend Dr. Peter Scare. Dr. Scare is Professor of New Testament and Chairman of the Department of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Scare, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Yeah, I'm so glad to be with you, Pastor. As we get started this morning, Dr. Scare, let's talk a little bit of context. What should we know about Luke, whether, I mean, the entirety of his gospel and immediate context that helps us into this section from chapter 8 today? Yeah, Luke is, um, well, we say he's the physician, and he is. Um, Luke is also, and we're going to see this as we go along, he's kind of the Eighth Commandment evangelist. That is, he explains hmm. things in the kindest ways. <laughs> and um, when you look at uh, the other Gospels, you look at Mark, for instance, and, and Mark really comes from the imprimatur or the approval of Peter. And, uh, you know, it's hard on the disciples. You have all these kind of things, oh, you of little faith, have you no faith? Are you still blind? Can you not see? And even at the end, you know, there's no indication that there's the light bulb has turned on. Hmm. And that's wonderful to see because it reminds us not to, you know, this is the way unbelief is going to persist in the church. Uh, we believe, Mark is the only gospel that says, I believe, help my unbelief. Hmm. And Luke is a little bit different. Luke is the gospel of beauty. Um, it attracts us to our Lord, uh, kind of painting a picture. And discipleship looks almost more attractive in Luke. Um, Luke is the gospel of the burning heart and, uh, on the road to Emmaus. It's the gospel of open eyes. And it leads us to the book of Acts, where the apostles and uh, the disciples are bold in their proclamation of the gospel. So they're kind of different ways of, of telling the story. And um, Luke also, we have to remember, is it's kind of the next generation. So when you look at Matthew and John, boy, they can be hard on themselves. You know, you can always – self-deprecation is good. So if I, you know, if I engage in a kind of uh, word of self-deprecation, like if I say, boy, I could use a little, lose a little weight, and then if you say, yeah, you are fat, well, that's <laughs> not really very nice. You know, it's uh, – so the disciples can talk about their lack of faith, but for us to join in is not really great because these were indeed great, great men. I mean, these are heroes. Peter is an incredible man, a man of courage, a man who founded the church. And Luke is kind of like that step below, and he can look at all of the, um, the apostolic leadership, all of the people helped found the church, and he's grateful. So he can look at Peter and John and Paul, and he's like, this is just Sometimes it's, you know, being a professor, it could be like this. A student might say, oh, Dr. Scott, I really love your lectures, you and so-and-so. And I'm like, I hate so-and-so. So you feel <laughs> kind of like, um, oh, my gosh. Well, Luke is kind of like that because he just appreciates. I mean, he's the one who just appreciates everybody who played a role in the founding of the church. He's a great guy. And um, you now he's also a storyteller. He's an artist. Matthew's more of a teacher, but he's the one who pictures for us Christ as our Savior. Hmm. I appreciate that that comment about you know the next generation and how he looks at the apostles and, and pictures them. He he really hasn't had a whole lot to say about the apostles so far. We haven't seen too many of their their foibles. We know who they are at this point. But I, I do think I mean I think I think you're right that that he is a little and we're going to see it I think in this text where he's not as as harsh as he would be say as Mark records it. But I want to. With that in mind, that he's grateful for the apostles, he still has been very clear up to this point, and I know this will continue into our text, that the authority is not in any of these men, but it is in the word of Jesus that they carry. I mean, that that has been very clear in Luke, that, that Jesus' word has authority when he speaks 
things happen. And so for as grateful as he is for the the 12 and and how he I don't know if admires them or you know holds holds them up and recognizes the role they've played, he also is is completely clear that it is the word of Jesus that's doing the work through these men. Yeah, it's it's the word of Jesus and um you know it's the word of the one through whom the world was created. God said and it was so. And to the centurion, the centurion says, I am a man under authority. I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And that's a great confession of faith you know, on behalf of the centurion. And that can be found both in Matthew and in Luke. Uh, the Luke indifference is the centurion in Luke is actually uh, represented by friends of the synagogue because he built for them a, a synagogue. So even Luke is even friendlier to are the children of Israel, among whom there was a faithful remnant. But yeah, our Lord is, um, he's not like, he's not, he's, he's not just a prophet. You can talk about a prophet Christology, but he's the one who opens his mouth and he speaks with authority, mm. authority that is not derived from men, authority that is not like the scribes, but he speaks and, and it is so. And uh, we certainly see that authority in these two stories here. And, um, you know, the first one is, is a calming of the storm. We're right talking about creation. Mm. Well, we're right back into creation. I mean, this is, this is the one through whom the, the world was created. The one who divided, you know, separated the firmament and the waters from the sky and, and, uh, and made it all happen. Um, through that word, let it be. And so it was. And we see the same thing here that, uh, it's a crisis for the disciples, but not for Jesus, because he's the calm in the middle of the storm, because he is the master of wind and wave. Let's go ahead and take a look at that text, then. We're in Luke 8, beginning at verse 22. One day he, Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? That's the first part of our text. That's Luke 8, verses 22 to 25. So, Doctor Scare, I mean, Luke. You know, one day here's. Uh, I've, we've noticed this earlier. Sometimes Luke is a little less exact in his timing. One day this happened. So, so Jesus gets into the boat with his disciples, and he. I think this is significant that Jesus is the one who initiates this. He says, "Let's go to the other side of the lake." Th- this text starts with a promise from Jesus, saying, "Hey guys, we're going to the other side of the lake, and we're going to get there one way or another." As it, as it turns out, it's it. It's through the storm. But I think that that's important, that, that we see Jesus' word at the very beginning of this text. Let's go over to the other side. Yeah, that's great. It's going to be one way or the other. In this case, it's <laughs> going to be the other. And um, you're right. So in, in the Gospels, the boat really is, in all four Gospels, the boat is a picture of the church. Of course, it is a literal boat, and the disciples were literally in the same boat as Jesus, but we learn, I mean, it's, it's the, gospel, the, the boat is the place of where they will be fishing men alive. You know, they, they call, they're called from the boat, and uh, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And the boat is, um, I mean, I've seen, been on the Sea of Galilee, and I've seen these kinds of boats. Well, they're not that big, and uh, the sea can be incredibly rough. I mean, it's, it's so, de- you know, deceiving when you're on a body of water like that because it can be so tranquil. And it's kind of like maybe, I don't know, for those who live near the Great Lakes, you know, you're driving along and all of a sudden a snow squall will come and it might be in a five mile area, but you feel like you're in an incredible blizzard and it can be an incredibly frightening. Um, the same thing with the Great Lakes. You can go there many, many a time and it just seems like a, a lovely, the water is lovely and you couldn't believe. And then, you know, the wreck of the Edmunds Fitzgerald, many Many a great ship has gone down in Lake Michigan, and so also here on the Sea of Galilee. Well, they say they get into the boat, and um, and uh, the disciples, uh, he says to them, "Let's go to the other side of the lake." And I do think, you know, this is this is also a picture of the Christian life. 
And the Christian life is always let's you know let's go to the other side. And the other side is is our heavenly home. The other side is um, is our destination. Will we make it in this? Sometimes in the Gospel of you know you think about the Gospel of Luke, it's a journey, and mostly in the Gospel of Luke, the journey is on foot. They follow Jesus to Jerusalem. Um, take up your cross and follow me. But you're walking on the path. You walk on the path from baptism. You walk through Galilee. You walk to Jerusalem. All the way up, really, into the ascension. You shall follow him into the heavenly. You shall follow him to the tomb, to death, but also to the resurrection, and also into the heavenly places with him. Now, this also, though, anticipates, I believe, the uh, the book of Acts, because they have this kind of, it's a technical term, and they, uh, the ESV, and they sailed. I mean, this is the kind of, um, again, these aren't sails, but, they, you know, they embarked. This is also the kind of language we'll find in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, the boat does play another prominent role, because in the book of Acts, you see, um, you see Paul and his sea journeys. And the sea journeys... There are two destinies, you know, or two points of destination in uh, Luke X. The first one is to Jerusalem, and that's to the cross, and that's where Christ must go. But, you know, you begin the book of uh, Luke, and it's, oh, you know, it's Theophilus. Oh, dear Theophilus, and you've been catechized in this way. That's written in a very Greco-Roman way. And if you look at the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, it's in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be cucked, which tells you in Luke Acts, the first destination is Jerusalem, but the next one is Rome. And to get to Rome, it's going to, you're going to get on the boat. And, uh, so, and that Rome represents really taking the gospel to the world. It's part of the evangelizing. It's setting sail into you know, uncharted waters. And will we make it to the other side? Yeah, let's go to the to the other side. And I love this. He fell asleep. And, you know, uh, when you look at that, I think the first thing is, is in, in the Psalms, you hear about, you know, the person who is unrighteous is always, you know, turning in bed, can't get any sleep. And maybe you or I, if we're anxious about something, you know, those nights can be long because you're always wondering, you're thinking about things, maybe thinking about your kids or thinking about losing a job thinking about illness, thinking about something you did, you're guilty, all sorts of things run through our head. But our Lord sleeps the sleep of the righteous, and he, he has no problem going right to sleep, even if it's, even if it's there on the boat. And uh, as then there, there it is. There's the windstorm that comes up, and it can happen very quickly. And, you know, they're trying to get the water out, which um, it shows you that and maybe a lot of people in congregations are like that now. They're feeling like the water's coming into their yeah. congregation. They're always with a bucket, you know. Yeah. All sorts of things can happen, and you feel like, oh, my goodness, will we ever make it to the other side? Well, don't be, you know, don't get down too quickly because it happened on the boat that Jesus was, was, with it, was in. And, um, and I don't know, the water's coming, and I don't know whether he feels the, you know, the moisture yet, but, you know, he's still sound asleep so it's a marvelous beginning to this is um, with jesus falling asleep and then the storm that comes up and, I, and the parallels aren't exact but there it sounds like almost some echoes of jonah that that jesus because but but for different like jonah's asleep for the wrong reason in the boat and the windstorm comes up there as a as a sign of god's judgment here jesus is asleep for the right reason and he's he's perfectly calm during the storm i don't i don't know maybe there's nothing there i don't know dr scare have you ever thought are there any connections we could make between jesus and jonah from this t i know jesus yeah, makes I, that connection but from this text are there connections oh i think so and you know i'm not sure whether jonah's asleep for the wrong reason he's hmm. kind of you know He's got faith, and uh, he's not doing what he, you know, should be. But he's kind of resigned. I mean, it's like mm. he's not confident. He's not thinking this is great. But there's a certain point, you know, where whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Mm. It doesn't mean it's going to be triumphant, but it's going to be in God's hands. And I also love the fact about Jonah. He is the unwilling prophet, but he's like, you know, 
well, guys, yeah, you better throw me into the sea or else you're not getting out of this. I mean, he's will- <laughs> maybe that's not bold, but in another way, it's kind of like, yeah, this is the way it is now. Unless you throw me down, you're not going to make it. So there is a kind of self-sacrifice there that I think is uh, really wonderful. Hmm. Now, but the thing is, when he wakes, um, when you look at Mark, it really has to do with the church under persecution, because in Mark, it's like, do you not care? Does it not matter to you that we are perishing? So it really is, you know, this is a church that's wondering, look at what we've gone through. Look what they've done to us. And it doesn't seem like you're answering our prayers. And uh, again, Luke doesn't go that way, but it says they went and they woke him saying, master, master, we are perishing. And that's significant because this word um, in verse 24 for master is epistata, epistata. Um, mas- master, master is kind of like, um, it's like a step below kurios or Lord. In the Gospel of Luke, whenever the disciples are either confused or their faith is halfway, they call him epistata or master. And uh, it happens, for instance, when the disciples call Peter first in the boat. And um, and Jesus says, you know, put down your nets. He says, epistata, master, you know, we haven't caught anything, cause he, and he hasn't caught on. And later, when he gets the fish, I mean, he's, he's in repentant mode, and he's like, Lord, you know, be away from me, for I am a sinner, because he, now he comes in faith, and he knows Jesus is the curious or the Lord. Uh, we see it also on the Mount of Transfiguration, when they don't, you know, they see the prophets, they see uh, Moses and Elijah, and they see Jesus, um, but they say epistata. You know, Peter says, epistata or master, shall I build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So at this point, they are not, I mean, they still recognize his leadership, but at this point, they're not fully uh, calling upon him as Lord. Hmm. And so, but he, he still answers, and he rebuked, he awoke and rebuked the wind and the and the raging seas, and then he says, where is your faith? And, you know, as we were talking before in the Gospel of Mark, it's, um, you have little faith, or do you have any faith, or do you not yet believe? Here, it's assuming that they do have faith, and, you know, Luke's right, they did believe. But, you know, we don't always act on our belief. Um, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ absolutely, and yet there are times in the way I, that I act, I mean, it show, I don't show it at all because I'm acting as if I don't believe. I'm not putting that into account. I'm not plugging that into the equation, and I'm acting as if he weren't anywhere or could do anything. Um, where is your faith? So it's recalling the fact that, yeah, they they do have faith, and... Um, of course, they will exercise it greatly in the in the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. With the the what you were saying about the title that they use, epistata instead of curios, the the Greek word master as opposed to lord, is and and then Jesus' question, "Where is your faith?" It seems like there that's related. That you know, where is your faith? They didn't address him as lord; they addressed him instead as master. And I, I think then that, that we could even draw the connection to their question at the end. Who then is this? It's almost like, keep keep thinking, guys. Who is this? He is not just epistata. He is is curios. That's who you're you're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, you know, as we listen, we want to raise our hand. I know who he is. I know who he is. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is the, 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 the thing for all of us is— um, because our church is going through really tempestuous times and, boy, all sorts of difficulty in a culture that absolutely hates us. People are, you know, really under the gun. Children are being, uh, you know, taught falsehoods in the schools. People are worried about losing their jobs. It seems like the lie is winning, Mm. and it seems like the Lord is asleep. Well, he's not. And the second thing is, is, you know, when when you're in the church, um, don't worry so much about the size of the church because the Titanic can hit an iceberg and sink. You know, uh, destroyers and aircraft carriers can also be brought down. 
But this little boat, whatever, this fishing boat, it's not going down. As long as Jesus is there, it's fine. You're going to be fine. And um, I like the Gospel of Mark in the sense that he equates, um, you know, he asks them, do you have any bread? You know, we forgot to bring the bread. The idea is this, as long as, when you go to the Eucharist, when you go to the Lord's Supper, that's the sacrament of our Lord's presence. And when you think about the Lord's Supper, this is a good uh, pericope, a good story to remember, because when you have the body and blood of Christ, you're reminded that our Lord is present with us in the church, and it's going to be okay. Um, you know, this is the this is the promise of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, he makes me to walk in green pastures, he restoreth my soul. And then, yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So it's the presence of our Lord that makes all the difference. And if he's there, we're safe. And uh, this is our Lord is Emmanuel. He is the one who will be with us always. And then in the Gospel of Luke, to, talk, to get the bread thing going, well, Luke has the bread thing because they're on the uh, road to, to Emmaus, and uh, he's made known to them in the breaking of the bread, and then he disappears. He doesn't leave. He disappears, so he's going to continue to be with them in the church. So this picture of Jesus on the boat, you know, you got Jesus, you got everything, you know, don't, there's nothing to worry about. And uh, he is the Lord who commands the wind and the water, and they obey him. The other thing is this, I want to add, is that um, this miracle, the wind and the water, it's one that's different than from, you know, all the healing miracles, because the wind and the water are not only the elements of creation, but they're, they're the elements of the new creation found in baptism. So the wind is another word for the spirit, and the water, of course, is the element of life. Um, at the beginning, you know, the waters uh, teem with life. You can't have li uh, wa uh, life without the water. But also that's a picture of holy baptism. And in baptism, our Lord uses those elements of creation, water and spirit, to bring new life to us. Okay, so that let me. I'm gonna dig into that one a little bit because I, I don't know that I've ever heard it put that way, but I really like it. So, I mean, on the one hand, you know, Jesus is the one who commands the wind and the water. I suppose my mind tends to go to to Job with that. You know, I mean, where where the Lord identifies Himself to Job as the one who created everything, who has uh, particularly the sea at His command, and so so Jesus there identifies Himself with the God of the Old Testament, with Yahweh. That's who He is. But but I think so. The, the idea that, that you're, you're putting out there, and again, I, I like it, I just never really thought about it before, that when we see Jesus with the power over the wind and the water, and that Greek word for wind would be the same for spirit, we should also understand that, well, how can water do such great things? Because Jesus is the one at work in that spirit and water to do these great things. Is that, that the idea you're getting at? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I first, you know, I, I kind of thought about this in the Gospel of uh, Matthew, because there in chapters 8 and 9, he does 10 miracles. And the one miracle that's not like the other is this one. It's the calming of the storm. And those are the elemental miracles. I mean, it's, it's, it's one where we really get back to creation, that our Lord is the God of creation. And what we need now is a new creation. And our Lord does not in the new creation begin ex nihilo, out of nothing, but he uses the elements of creation and then takes them to a new level. And it's the one miracle among, when you look at Jesus' miracles, um, they are all baptismal in nature. and Not, not the feeding of the 5,000, that's a different kind of thing. But when you look at the miracles in, in the gospel, everything, I, I tell the students, everything that Jesus did, he does now today, except on a higher level. So... He drives out our unclean spirits. To part of unclean spirit, make room for the Holy Spirit, we say in baptism. Um, he cleanses leprosy. Well, that's cleansing the leprosy of our sin, which is a spiritual problem. He is the one who raises up a paralytic so that he might walk in the newness of life. That's baptismal language. He raises the dead. Well, of course, that's you, you can't be raised from the dead unless you're baptized into the death of Christ and then rise again. Um, 
you know, when you look at deaf, uh, uh, blindness, blindness is a spiritual condition. I once was lost, but now I see kind of the St. Paul road uh, to Damascus sort of thing. Uh, he has eyes to, you know, if you have see, you look, but you don't see. Um, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So hearing has a spiritual dimension where our Lord opens our ears and then he loosens our tongue. All of these are baptismal miracles, and those are like once in a lifetime, they would define your life, they would change your life. If you had been blind, it would be amazing. You'd always talk about, now I can see. If you were deaf, you would always talk about the day you received your hearing. So these, um, that's what baptism is like. It's this it's the one birth, the rebirth that gives you a whole new life. And in the middle of that, in Matthew, is this water and the wave thing, because the ultimate miracle, when you get to the end, you know, look at Matthew 10, you have all these miracles the disciples do. In Matthew 10, they don't get to do, they're not told to do any of those things. They're not cleansing lepers, and they're not raising the dead. What they are doing is baptizing. And baptism is the miracle that makes all the other miracles permanent. So all the other miracles that our Lord did were temporary. So, I mean, a person who is a paralytic, he might walk again, but he might, you know, develop arthritis or he might get run over by a Roman chariot. And then he loses, you know, he might not walk again later because that's just the way it goes. A blind man who could receive his sight, he might get poked in the eye and lose his sight in one of his eyes. No miracle is made permanent until the day of the resurrection, and that's ultimately what baptism is. And baptism is, um, is the sacrament of the new creation. It's how the new creation begins. So I do think when you look at this, there's an elemental nature to this. Um, he is in control of the elements, but these elements are exactly what we need for a new life. It's, we need the water, and we need and we need the spirit, the wind. Uh, that's fantastic, Dr. Scare. I love what you said about baptism, that it's made complete, makes these other miracles permanent. Paul, in, in Romans 6, you know, if we've died with Christ, we will be raised with him as well. And that is our hope in Jesus Christ. We're going to keep talking about this text from Luke chapter 8 on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron. We're talking to Dr. Peter Scare today. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, February 10th. We're studying Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 39 with the Reverend Dr. Peter Scare. He is professor of New Testament and chairman of the Department of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Scare, prior to the break, we were looking at Jesus calming a storm. Now Luke also records for us, Jesus, what, what does he do when he gets to the other side of the sea? Well, that's what he tells us next, beginning now in verse 26 of the chapter. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, 
sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with them. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. That's the rest of our text for today that takes us through Luke verse Luke 8, verse 39. Dr. Scare, if, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time that Jesus ventured into Gentile, particularly Gentile territory. Is that the, that the country of the Gerasenes? Yeah, it's um, like it's east of uh, it's east of uh, the Sea of Galilee. It's in the Decapolis region. Uh, I'm trying to think of the Gospel of in the Gospel of uh, Mark. It's th- this region that he goes to in the feeding of the four thousand, for instance. So it, it's Israel, but it's where all the it's like the same thing in Israel today, I suppose, in a way. Um, Israel is the land of the uh, you know, the Jewish Jewish people live there, but I think. I mean, nearly half the people aren't, mm-hmm. a lot of Arabs and other groups. So the same thing also, I suppose, in a way here, that this tends to be a more Gentile area. So that's right. And, uh, boy, isn't this a rollicking good story, though? No kidding. This is the kind of, this is the kind of story, I mean, we got to read to our boys. They'll love it. And, you <laughs> that's know, right. They'll have an arch book with some, have some, I mean, this is really <laughs> Jesus. He's boss here, and he's a fighter, and this is... This is no milk toast Jesus. I mean, this is the Jesus who's in command, and it, I mean, it's it's a little bit frightening. I mean, the people are frightened, and they don't even know who this guy is, but they know that uh, he means business. So it's a it's just a great story here, and you know, he he goes after this you know this boat and let's get to the other side. Well, we're not yet in paradise. The other side here is not yet. That's right. In fact, we meet this um, this guy who. I think and Luke kind of has it like he, he had demons. I mean, well, you know, he had demons. There are different ways to think about the demons in the gospel. One is you might think of them as unclean spirits. And, you know, I think the unclean spirits in that sense, they're involved in all of our lives. And so when you think of the fruits of the spirit, joy, kindness, gentleness, um, I should me- I should memorize that song, but uh, about this. But the fruits of the spirit are just lovely, and like that's the kind of world I want to live in. Uh, but when you look at the fruits of the unclean spirit, it's bitterness, resentment, envy, anger, suspicion. As a pastor, you know, we walk into houses, and some houses just feel like, you know, the air is light because Christ is there. There's forgiveness. There's love. There's joy. You walk into other houses and you can just feel the heaviness in the air because there's just kind of this resentment and bitterness that just hangs over. It's almost it's almost palpable. And uh, that's one kind, and that's the kind of spirit really that can infect all our homes. And really the best way to handle that those spirits are by uh, praying out loud and by singing hymns and that sort of thing kind of clear the air. Even at a church meeting, every church meeting should begin with, at least with a, a short prayer and maybe a, a short stanza of a hymn or something like that, just to clear the air and just to remind ourselves, to, uh, create the goodwill and the bond of the Holy Spirit. This guy, though, is not just unclean spirits. He's got bigger problems. He's got the kind of problems that maybe we see, I mean, you know, what but when I was a pastor, I did more of this kind of visitation in places where people are shut away. And here you have a kind of uh, an absolute madness created by the demons. And the demons have really, they're not just uh, filling the air with this, you know, all these kind of uh, bad vibes that we have towards one another. But um, these demons have really taken over this guy in a in a dramatic way. So, um, and it, and it shows, I mean, he's the kind of crazy you might meet out on a street that's not well tended because he's got no clothes on. He didn't live in a house and, uh, he loved to, to live among the tombs, which tells you, you know, these demons that inhabit him just love death. So they just, uh, 
the, the closer they can get to death, it seems like the happier, happier they are. I mean, this the, the picture that is painted in this account is one in which Jesus has, I think, entered into absolute enemy territory, where I mean, it's almost like he's he's going into utter darkness and he alone is light. I mean, that's that's always the image. You, you talked about a story that we need to read to our boys. I think you're exactly right, because Jesus is, he's no wimp here, and he's, he's going where no one else would be victorious. It, I mean, I, I, like I think, and I don't know if Luke records this or maybe I'm remembering from, yeah, he's, he, it's here that he would break the bonds. I mean, other people have tried to help this man, tried to do something for him. No one's been able to. And, and here's Jesus going into just utter enemy territory. And, and even when the demons come to Jesus at the very beginning, they know their time's up. I mean, it's quite, it's just such a striking scene to, to present Jesus as the one who has come to, to conquer even our worst enemies. Yeah, and this is, I mean, that's really, really true, and, um, you know, I think we're going to see more and more of these kind of scenes in our own land, and it's already happening, um, but you you really sense it, for instance, um, when you go to places like, um, in Africa, right now there's kind of a, a religious battle, and it's really between the Christians and the Muslims, um, and who will take the territory away from the witch doctors. So the witch doctors really control many of the villages and Christians come with their with the gospel and uh, are building little churches everywhere and Islam comes with huge mosques funded from places like Saudi Arabia and they'll even give you a little money if you go to the mosque. Um, but when you when you look at these villages and the witch doctors there it's quite palpable you can feel it um, they are demon. The demons are right out there for you to see. I mean, some people say like in America, we have demon alcohol, we have demons in the drugs. The demons are all at work. But it, it, for a long time here, they've really played the game of playing more underground because they almost like not to be thought of as real. But if you go to places where paganism is really alive and well as paganism, um, this sort of thing is, uh, you know, all too real and all too prevalent. You go to India and you go to houses and they'll have all sorts of, you know, art on their house. And it's, it's one pagan art or pa- they have their own pagan gods in order to fight off the other pagan gods or the spirits. I shouldn't say gods. They're really daimonium. They're, they're low level. They don't think that they're God, but they're, 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 they recognize there are very dark forces. And you're right, this is the kind of thing, you know, as, as you go to the edge, this is the kind of thing that you're going to see um, as the missionary work leaves um, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We're going to, you know, move away from the land of synagogues, or, and we're going to go to the place where uh, paganism is alive and well, and the devils are living more living more openly. So you're right. This is like, this is open. This is open warfare in a way that's just stunning. Mm. And um, so you have this guy, he sees Jesus. And uh, what I love this is, you know, what's it up? What, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high? I beg you, do not torment me. Now, the guy is saying this, the guy who's naked and the guy who's, uh, homeless and the guy who's hanging out in the tombs it's his voice but um he's not the one really in control of himself it's uh the one who's speaking really is um well the demon or um well we're going to find out so um i beg you do not torment me they know who he is the demons know um the demons are I know in the Gospel of Mark, they're the first ones really to recognize. They recognize he's the Son of God, you know, long before anybody else does. So they know uh, what he's all about. And um, you see this. It's just remarkable, the detail, that uh, many times, so maybe he comes in and out of this, you know. Many times the the demon had come out of him. He was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. So, you know, We've seen this. I mean, the demons do have a way of just 
bringing the body is 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 capable of incredible things under stress. There are stories of, you know, a child that's caught underneath a car, and mom at that one moment can lift up the car and save the child. So uh, the demons also, it looks like uh, they give this guy, they tap into his strength. So it's almost like super human strength. And then this next part, I think, is just really telling. Um, he asks, what is your name? Mm. And then he said, Legion. And this is just huge because Legion is, um, it's the plurality. It's the, if you want to understand demons, they're not like Satan. Satan is the mastermind. Satan is clever. Satan is full of deceit. Satan is the one who figures out how to proceed. He's the chess player. If you look at the demons, though, um, they are the ones who have been duped themselves by Satan. Now, that doesn't mean they're not evil. They are evil. But they themselves, you know, you could imagine, you know, Satan is up there and let's, let's have a revolt. Yay! And a third of the angels leave. And it's like, what have we gotten ourselves into? And, um, you know, they've been in league with Satan for so long. But when you're in league with Satan, it's not like he's asking for your opinion, nor is it kind of a democracy. Um, these guys are all following the party line. And there's that, this is part of the nature of evil. It's kind of like um, debating somebody about, we always like try to do pro-life apologetics, which is great. But try arguing with a dyed-in-the-wool pro-abortion person, and you end up talking to Legion. Because Legion doesn't, their minds no longer work, really. They don't, they're not able really to function at that level. What they have are mantras, and what they do is repeat. We as conf Christians confess the truth together, but when we become Christians and we have the mind of Christ, our mind becomes clear, and we're able to see things as they are. Uh, that's not true with evil. With evil, there's nothing that can hold it together. Uh, there's nothing, there's no coherence to evil, because evil is simply about destroying. It's about deconstructing. It's about taking apart. And when you look at the legion here, and we'll see it, our Lord almost has a kind of, he has pity on them, because it's just pathetic. When you look about the people who have been duped in our society, um, like, tell me how we don't know that a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. How is it that we came in a place in our society where we think, oh, yeah, he's transitioned to be a girl? Well, you know, 10 years ago, that would have just been absurd. Our grandfathers would have laughed at us, but now everybody says it, and everybody says it at the exact same time. That's the nature of evil. That's legion. It's like they all are like – in. It's not an agreement. It's kind of like in a deathly monotone that they speak because um, even as they have captured this man, they are in a sense in their own prison already, which is evil and it is a prison in and of itself. Is that, I mean, does the their request then to go into the pigs, is, is that related to this idea that, like, they've been duped, that they just, they're just repeating things, and they maybe they think that there's going to be some kind of escape for them by going into the pigs, but there ends up not being? Is, is that request a part of what you're saying? Well, the, you know, the, they actually are trying to make a deal, and our Lord does have mercy on them mm. in this way, because they're— you know what? They don't want us to go into the abyss, and Luke's the one who calls it the abyss, and the abyss is— uh, they know enough to know their final fate. And Satan knows. Satan knows. That's why he's so angry right now. I mean, Satan is like a devouring lion, but he's like, he can listen to the clock ticking, tick, 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 tick. Mm -hmm. And he knows the alarm's going to go off and Christ is going to come and he's done. So he is just going on a mad rampage to uh, cause as much harm, to bring as many people down with him as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. And the demons also know that their time will be up. They know that they will be sent to the abyss, and they're praying, please don't send me to the eternal abyss yet. 
And our Lord doesn't, because really, in a sense, their time is not yet come. There will be a time when this is going to happen. Um, Satan is right now on a leash, but he's still allowed to roam, but only on a leash. The demons still, you know, kind of, they, they're still in the air. They're still around us, and they're able to, you know, do things up until a certain point. But um, being sent into the pigs, yeah, it's a, whatever their fate is, that's a better fate they know than to go into the abyss. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a really dramatic scene. These, these demons go into the pigs. The pigs rush down and into the lake, and they're drowned. Everybody sees this. I can only imagine the, the shock. Talk about the reaction within the, within the town to Jesus. Yeah, we should. Uh, this would be a great movie, but you'd have yes. to say, you know, no animals were hurt in this. That's we right. do it with a, whatever <laughs> those kind of computer graphics, I suppose, but it would make a great scene. But, um, yeah, the reaction is really stunning here because he sends the pigs down and he drives out the demon, and the guy is, you know, he's clothed and in his right mind, and I love that because clothed, you know, that, that's a baptismal imagery. He's not naked, yeah. but he's also... You know, he is as he should be, and he his mind is freed. He's in his right mind. And, you know, people who have come out of, in a sense, there's a demon aspect to alcohol when it overtakes you, or meth, something like that when it overtakes you, which that's going to overtake you. But people who are caught up in something, they feel so relieved when they're freed from it, and all of a sudden they can see things as they are. They can laugh again. They can enjoy things again. It's really wonderful. Um, but the other thing is, is the people, how do they deal with this? And they're seized with great fear. Now, I looked at some commentators, and it's like, they, they don't understand it. They, they say, well, this is a Gentile area, and they're worried that the Lord has taken all their pigs, which I guess is their prophet, so they don't want them in their area because of that. But it's not that. It's there is fear of Jesus as Jesus, because they look at Jesus and they're like, I don't want to be around this. I don't want to be around this fight. I don't want to be around this battle. It is far too much. And a lot of people still are like that, you know. Um, you know, he, when you look at uh, Jesus, he is like C.S. Lewis. He is uh, a good lion, but he's not a tame lion. And a lot of people just don't want to be around the lion. A lot of people would rather have a life. This is the church battle, the church militant. You know, it's the church militant. It's quite a fight. I mean, this is why we as guys really need to take it up. And uh, I don't want, you know, I don't want our children to have to fight these fights. But these are, but our boys can as they grow up to become men. But um, a lot of people just would rather not be bothered with this. A lot of people just don't want to think about these things. They would rather simply get up, and I understand this, but they want to get up, they want to have their yogurt or their cereal for breakfast, a cup of coffee, they want to do their daily routine. It's just they don't want to think about um, that what, we're, what, what we're actually up against, that we're fighting against you know, powers and not flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. A lot of this is I'd rather live in my cocoon and just – pretend that none of this is going on, even if they think that Jesus is on the right side, even if they think that Jesus is a good guy, they still want nothing to do with him because he still causes trouble for their lives. It's, it's a lot easier in life just to put your head in the sand. And I think, again, I think it's in our culture we see that because uh, I mean, I can go on and on about the kinds of things that are happening in our culture now. Mm. Um, you know, you can. a lot of people don't want to think about the slaughter of the unborn, 60 million children. You can mention it, but they just like, they want to move on quickly to the next thing. They don't want to hear about transgender surgeries. They don't want to hear about Christian suffering. They don't want to hear about any of that. They've got their life, and their life is, you know, it's simple, it's quiet and they can go without any of this fuss. And that's the way a lot of people are. And, you know, there's a sense with Jesus, if you look at, uh, you know, I think Matthew 11 and 12 addresses this question about, 
uh, people are wondering about Jesus himself. Maybe he, I mean, he, it, here's the thing is when the world looks at us too, sometimes if, if you look at two people fighting, you don't necessarily know who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. So you could have a very bad man enter into town and he might want to do horrible things to the village. A guy goes out and meets him and, uh, he says, I got to stop him, and he starts to wrestle him down to the ground. And then a person walks by, and is, you know, he's dressed in very nice clothes, and he's clean, and he goes, oh, look at those two guys fighting. You know, can't they let bygones be bygones or a pox on both their houses because they're both fighting? And you know, like one guy's like, but yeah, but I'm trying to save your kids. I'm trying to save your wives. I'm trying to save your village. And they're like, they want nothing of it. Like, oh, look at those people fighting. And – you know, this is the white glove people. Um, this is the people that, you know, I, I see this a lot. This, this is happening in a lot of our colleges. Um, there's a great uh, article, The Failure of the Evangelical Elite. A lot of people don't want to fight the LGBT rainbow or the critical thinking that's coming into their colleges. They'd rather be above it. They'd rather just pretend it doesn't happen. And they'll just be, oh, we'll be the peaceful guys. We'll be the good guys. And they don't want a guy like Jesus around because mm. Jesus reminds them that it really is a war. And this war is, you know, it's it's not pretty. I mean, this is a battle, and battles uh, can get bloody. And they don't want any of that. So mm. they're afraid. They're like, just get away from us. We want to go on and live our lives, you know, the way we like to live them without all this fuss. Mm. Now, that's not the reaction that the man has. He wants to stay with Jesus. And, and we've already seen him clothed in his right mind. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus, which I think is really significant. He's got the posture of a disciple. Dr. Scare, we've got about three minutes left here. Use that the last bit of time that we've got to, to tell us about the reaction of the man, his, his response, and then how Jesus sends him back to his home to tell the good, good news. Yeah, I mean, this is a natural reaction, and um, I mean, this is what I would, I hope I would say the same thing, too. I guess, you know, you think about uh, Jesus cleansing the lepers, and that's not the same, because he cleanses ten lepers. Only one comes to uh, thank him, and the other nine go off their merry way. They're just so happy to be leprosy-free. Well, this guy is like, at the feet of Jesus, which is exactly where you want to be. You know, it's it's a it's a... It's a posture of humility, but it's also the posture of one who is uh, willing to learn and to hear what our Lord has to say. And in a, he also never wants to leave our Lord's presence. And in that sense, you know, that's a taste of heaven. It's in heaven we shall never leave our Lord's presence. Um, but it, it's not time yet. It's like Mary Magdalene who clings to Jesus. And it's like all she wants to do is cling to Jesus after the resurrection. And there... You know, Jesus says, no, go to my brothers and tell them what happened, and go to the family. My brothers are the apostles. Go to the family, which is the church. And also, this is, I mean, this is our Lord also beginning the Gentile mission, because, no, go home. It's okay. Um, it's a way of saying, it's, you, you don't have to, we saw this, I think, with Naaman, the Syrian. Um, he doesn't have to stick with Jesus. He can go and live his life. And he can live it in service to God. He can live it in service to Christ. And um, unless he goes home, as when he goes home, he's going to have a story to tell, narrate to them the things that have happened. And when he tells this story, you know, they're going to hear the great things that – and I love the way he puts this, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Mm. Well, Jesus did it for, for, for him. Well, when Jesus did it for him – God did it for him because Jesus is God. God acts through Jesus, who is God's eternal son. He is himself God, and this is the message that he will um, – and, and he becomes and, – and you, you can imagine he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. So already we get a taste of the Great Commission, but it's simply done by a person. And this is by the way it still happens today. Uh, we, some of us are called to be preachers. We are called to speak from the pulpit, the very word of God. But the way the gospel actually gets out, the way people end up coming to church is, you know, a large percentage, a very large percentage is simply Christians telling other people 
about what God has done. And then they invite others to come and hear Jesus and to see Jesus. This is how the gospel word gets out, and this is how it, it works with this man who was uh, who had the demon, who had many demons, was held by the demons, and now is free. And he's got a great story to tell. And uh, so no doubt from his uh, from this miracle came many other miracles of faith. Others mm. came to faith because yeah. he told his story. Mm. Yeah, thanks be to God for those faithful witnesses, preachers, laity, all Christians who have spoken that good news so that others have heard and believed. The Reverend Dr. Peter Scare is Professor of New Testament and Chairman of the Department of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, helping us today with Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 39. Dr. Scare, thanks for being our guest today. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you've got any questions about Luke, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.